bull. Oh, and there's a red one. Those, that's Bloody Butcher. Oh, it's two different kinds? Well, it's a little mixed in here. It came out oh, of the nice. cleaner that way. It's what? It came out of the cleaner that way. Oh, okay. There's some left in there. Wow. And is this the, that's not the Jefferson, is it? No, this is Trucker's Favorite. What's it called? Trucker's Favorite. Trucker's Favorite. Trucker's Favorite. It, that's an heirloom, though, right? Yeah. Okay. Shoot, I'm not going to be able to see that.
Jenny Kay here from Late Bloomer Homestead, and I'm on the road today, and this is the epitome of Know Your Farmer. Tim Hobbs is an old friend of mine. Well, we you know, grew up in the same area, and if you've been following my channel for a long time, you've, you saw him my first season of Late Bloomer. We went out to the cornfield where he grows heritage corn. I'll put the link right up there, and you can check it out. Uh, where he talks about the importance of heritage corn and keeping that going and also how you plant it and all that. Well, today, for the first time, I've had the experience of being able to have my his corn ground personally for me. This is a first. I am going to be taking home 50 pounds of fine cornmeal that he actually grew and I'm so honored to be here. Hi, Tim. How you doing? <laughs> so I'm just gonna have him sit down and I'm gonna ask him a few questions and, and maybe that'll enlighten you. I mean, that was so much work. Well, it's fun. I mean, I've done it since for 30, 40 years and, and it's always a, just an enjoyment to do it because it's a, it's a thing that my ancestors did and your ancestors did, people that settled this country had to take their corn to a mill and get it ground. Or their grain, whichever it was, wheat or corn. And it was, uh, now that was work because it was a day's journey, usually on a horse to take it to a mill and wait your turn to get it ground and then back home again. Uh, this is the way we do it today, of course, is using different technology as far as the farming part of it, using different equipment. But the, the grinding of the stone, we're still using stone mills to do it with because it actually produces a better product. It doesn't heat up the corn. Uh, we can make it any way we want it, of course, fine. Uh, grits, flour, just whatever we want to make with it, we can do it. And that gives more of a variety of what people want or remember, and it's better for us since it's not you know, gluten, so that makes a lot of people that can't eat wheat uh, can resort to eating cornmeal. You don't really know when you go in the store and buy a package, it says stone ground. You don't really know if it was or not. Is there a difference in the quality? Well, it is because the stones run cooler. They, when you heat up corn or heat up the product, then it starts taking some of the nutrients out of it. So that's one reason the stones, if you keep the stones good shape, they make a real good cool product. And uh, where the other mills are roller mills, and they actually just press the corn, bust the corn, and squeeze it. Oh. And that usually causes heat to build up in it to some extent. So this is, doesn't do it, and uh, this is the way we've been doing it since the creation. A man figured out how to take a grain and beat it between two rocks yeah. and come up with a product. So, and, and, and grains were very important to us through our existence and way back to uh, man figured it out. I'm going to put the link on when we went to the actual old Spencer mill uh, where we saw the saw big the stones. Thing. They weren't working that day but you could see how the two big stones would rub together right. and of course the water went over the water wheel and that drove it right, right. and so now you have a, a diesel powered engine that runs this so when did they come up with these uh, well, these these type mills what we call a horizontal shaft because the shaft is horizontal to the stones the other stones lay flat these lay like this and one turns and the other one stationary same way with that big one the uh, after the Civil War, when most of the mills were burnt, by the, especially in the South, the uh, majority of them were put out of commission because they were feeding the Southern people or feeding the troops as, it, as the Northerners saw them. So they would burn the mills, destroy the crops. Uh, and then companies started coming back and they started making mills more portable. And we started coming up with steam engines. So steam engine could be set up pulling a, a building full of mills, as they did. Uh, even the flat runners or the roller mills or these type mills. And uh, these came out about 1865. And so this particular company wasn't in existence until about 1903 that they company started making the Methodist brand. But there were other companies, Nordyke Marion, that, that were actually in the 60s that made the same type mills. Mm -hmm. So they've been around a long time. And you said this company stopped making well, they stopped making this particular meal. They make the whole stainless now, but the company's been in business since 1903, and they're located over North Wilkesboro, North Carolina, called Meadows Mill Company, and they have some household meals that people can get. They're still stone, little small meals that have stone in them. You can do it in your house, or you can do it in production. 
Uh, we have a, a setup down in Linville, Tennessee that uh, has five 30 inch mills in it. This one is a 2016, so you can see that it's a lot bigger, more mass production that you could produce right. uh, for a, a bigger base. What we do is strictly just mostly for ourselves and friends. And uh, when we used to go out to the uh, craft shows and stuff and grind and demonstrate, we still do a little demonstrating, show people how it's done. But the uh, majority of us is just done for us or friends now. Well, Tim, you're not going to be able to do it forever. Maybe another 20 years or so. But <laughs> I don't know about that. The bag's getting heavier all the time. <laughs> yeah, but uh, what will happen to all this when you uh, decide not to do it? Well, is there I've somebody got a, young that... I've got a fellow that's, that's I've turned it over to most of the grinding to him. He's a lot younger than I am, and he does about 90% of it. And then I have a fellow down in Limbo that's uh, just turned 50, so he's got a lot more years left. And I encourage people, if they want to know how to do this, you know, I'd love to teach them. And I have people all over uh, Tennessee and different places that uh, I've taught how to do this and how to use these mills. Are you here. still keeping this old Spencer mill going? or? Well, it's mostly right now, it's just for to look at. Uh, we don't do anything in it as far as grinding. Uh, we don't have any water enough to, to run the wheel anymore. You mean through the stream? Well, we got plenty of water in the stream, but the, the, after the dam broke, the government kind of frowns on you putting back dams back up on creeks. So, oh, that's what I think you mentioned wheel. that. That's what yeah. would run the water wheel. So. When was the last time you actually ground corn in that old mill? The, well, we haven't ground in that old mill since we started putting it back together period because we just never had enough water. Oh, okay. Now, we do have it set up where we can put a tractor on it and start running it and that's our next goal. Uh, we've changed the pulleys, we've changed the way it's mounted uh, and we're just going to hook an old tractor to it and run it off a flat belt and we can operate the mill with that mm -hmm. without ever having to worry about the water anymore. So for you, you were a teacher mm -hmm. uh, as your profession, so this is just an extension of, of you teaching really. Um, it, it, it is to get people understand and how things were done and start a new, maybe somebody strikes an interest in them, you know, and they say, that looks neat, you know, I'd like to do that. And, uh, and that's what it's about. If we can keep these traditions going by teaching the younger people about how these old things were done, a lot of stuff is coming back. Blacksmithing is coming back and making strides. Uh, people that are raising grains or raising food at home that they've never done before. Uh, more people are putting out gardens, more people are learning how to can again. Uh, so it's a lot of this stuff is coming back because one day it may need to come back. People may need... It be, does need to come back now. <laughs> right, it needs to come back now. Be, be able to take care of yourself, not depend on going down to the store and buying everything you need. Yeah. So we're happy with it and uh, we can educate somebody else. Uh, it's just right down my alley. You're not making a profit. <laughs> from uh, I mean that's a lot of work to right. come down it's, here. It's, and... it's not a it's not a profit looking thing. Uh, you know it's more of a just a, the fun thing in it. Mm -hmm. I enjoy doing it. Uh, I just wish I could do it for another twenty years. Yeah. And bags are getting heavy, and uh, so it's getting to a point that uh, I'm just going to have to give it up or just come and assist basically without having to lift anything. And what about the growing of the corn? How much how much corn would a person have to grow in order to make something like this profitable? Uh, you'd have to have the ability to grind, plant a couple hundred acres oh. of this corn and be able to, to plant it, harvest it, uh, put it up, dry it, clean it, and then grind it. It's several different steps and before it ever gets to this mill. What is the cleaning step? Cleaning step is taking it out of the combine and running it through what we call a cleaner. And it has different screens in it. As it goes down through the screens, it separates the chaff to the small pieces or the broke pieces out of the corn. And then it comes up with a clean product, like you saw. It had nothing in it but just corn. And that's what we're looking for. So uh, to have anything else in it wouldn't be any good to us, you know, as far as trying to eat that. But, uh, and it, that can be used to feed like uh, the cattle mm -hmm. back into the cattle stream. Mm -hmm. And uh, chickens or hogs or whatever you want to feed them with. 
and then this uh, chaff that we saw came off of it, the white stuff and the husk, it's high nitrogen and it goes back in the ground. So we don't lose anything of it. And you're giving me a bag to take back for my garden. Right. Tell me a little bit about the corn that you just ground for me. You, is, you told me b before, but you couldn't hear it over the... It's the name of it is Trucker's Favorite, and it's a white open pollinated corn. Most of the time we call it heritage corn. Uh, we have two, three different kinds of corns. We have a open pollinated, which is what we're using, and then you have a traditional corn that's raised now that's uh, mostly we call Roundup Ready because it's mainly for the ethanol market. Most of that corn, but 90% of it, goes into making alcohol for the fuel market. Uh, some of it finds its ways into the feed, and it's uh, not a good thing because uh, they've came up with a way to poison a bug in it, and that stays in the grain, and it's not good for the animals. Uh, so people need to go back to raising this corn. The only thing it's not productive, it doesn't put out the acreage. Uh, if we get 115 acres of this corn per acre, like we're doing extremely well. Uh, where the other corn, the yellow corn, will put out 220, 225 bushel an acre. And that makes, uh, you know, for them to make a profit, they have, have to do that because the seed's so high, fuel's so high, chemicals are so high before they do that. And this corn is raised primarily nothing but seed. No chemicals. No chemicals. The yellow corn, so from, for, to be clear, you're talking about the, uh, the, the whole ethanol corn. Right that corn with the chemicals, the Roundup Ready and all of that stuff, right. which you have nothing to do we with. We don't have anything to do with this. We right. just plant it and uh, go back and cultivate it and try to keep the weeds down. out. And find the weeds out grow the, the weeds. Corn does. It gets up 10, 12 feet tall. And uh, well, then when we get ready to pick it, we'll either pick it or we'll combine it. How do you uh, keep the weeds down? Because you can't, you said you can't spray it because it'll kill no, we, uh Normally we just come, take a cultivator, a tractor and a cultivator and go in there and, and just like they used to and just take the weeds out, tear them up with the roots between the stalks of corn. And when it gets to that point, then they get a sh short run and so they finally either die out or they do come back, but it's too late then. Mm -hmm. The corn's already up and making itself. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the combine will take the weeds out. Mm -hmm. so, so. You were saying about drying the corn, how important that is before you grind it? Well, we have to get the corn and we have to get it down to about 10 or 12 percent. How do you know what the percentage is? Well, we have a, a, a little gadget. A moisture meter? A moisture meter. And you put it into it and it tells us how much moisture is in it. Okay. And uh, that, that's the way we can figure out what our corn is. Now, the old timer's way was this, like the corn that we just picked, we have some hickory king and uh, we plant it and then we just wait till we have enough frosty weather and the frost will take the moisture out of the corn. And we do that, then we can go in and pick it. So this is uh, another way of doing it. We raise all our hickory cane that way. We just leave it in the field and uh, hope the deer don't eat it all. And then we get ready to uh, pick it and we'll pick it and uh, then we'll go back and shuck it and shell it. And uh, that way it's dry. What about squirrels? Do they eat much? We have squirrel issues. We have coon issues. Yeah, uh, deer are the biggest, their biggest uh, aggravation to it. Uh, they'll take a field of the, uh, her or the heritage corn and they'll tear it up pretty good if you're not careful. Uh, unless you wait and call them with fences or whatever terms to keep them out of there. But the, uh, the yellow corn that they raise, uh, they won't bother it hardly because animals are smarter than we are. They know what's good. When you say the yellow corn, you mean the, the GMO the, stuff? The GMO corn. Okay, yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> of course they are. They, they won't I saw them. some video the other day, and it was like some, some there was, you know, how they're trying to push fake meat now? Mm hmm And these animals were going for the, the real meat, and, and they weren't even touching the fake meat, you know? They're, they're smart. They figure it out. The fellow that raises this trucker's favorite for us uh, has the cattle ranch. And before he started raising this corn, he was raising the yellow corn strictly to sell and, and then feed out some calves. But uh, when he found out about the yellow corn, he quit raising it. And he said when he noticed a big difference in his cattle, when he started taking the, this white corn that came off the cleaner, which is the ground of corn or, or the pieces and whatever, he said they would see him coming and they would head to the bins 
work waiting for him to feed them this corn or the other corn they he just pour it out and they may walk over there and they may not yeah so the animals are a lot smarter than us yeah in, in some sense we'll eat anything somebody puts out in front of us sometimes it may not be the best for us that's right when we get the the white corn the hickory cane and the uh, jefferson corn out then uh, we'll be ready to start with it in January. We're going to wait. We always wait till January before we start shelling it. Well, they use bins now with blowers on them that blow air. And if you're trying to get the, the moisture out quicker, then you can put heat on it. And that takes the uh, moisture out of it to dry it down even faster. Uh, of course, that's a person who's got a lot of acreage, just got to get it out and get it in before the weather gets bad. And that's what they'll do. They'll mm -hmm. uh, put it in those bins and then dry it down. But that's not the old-timey ways because the they didn't have all that. No. People used to take, pick their corn, put it in corn cribs, and let it dry out in corn cribs. Right. And they would put it up way off the ground where the animals wouldn't bother. And they put slots in it or use screens around it so the air could travel Just to it. Just in the, its husk? Mm -hmm. In the husk. Leave it in the husk or out of the husk. It didn't make any difference. Oh, yeah. And it would right. dry either way. Depending how they wanted to pick it. Right. Uh, there's a renewed interest in the old ways and a lot of young people are starting to homestead and realizing what you were just saying about the need for doing things ourselves instead of depending on stores and, and every, you know, you can't hardly get, find somebody to fix anything anymore, so. No, it's gotten to be a problem with uh, supply chain and people working. Yeah. And, and people that want to work are usually backed up for weeks. Right. Uh, so. But this stuff, uh, what we're doing and trying to teach people how to do is something that they can do at home and do themselves and take care of themselves and have a product that they can eat year round. Yeah. That's the one thing corn has always been a great product of. That's why the Indians raised it and showed the uh, early people how to raise it. It was because it was something they could eat fresh or keep it and grind it and keep it through the winter and they didn't have to worry about going out and trying to find something to eat because it was a, a year-long product that they could keep you around. What's the best way to, to make grits? Uh, well, we like to take them and, and use, uh, of course, you put them in water, a little chicken stock, a little salt, and then bring them up to a bowl for about 20 minutes. And then put, uh, we like smoked Gouda cheese. Mm and put smoked Gouda cheese. Some people like yellow cheese, some people like all kinds of cheese. And then you just take and pour them on a plate and spoon out to use some uh, stir fry pork or chicken or beef or shrimp, shrimp mm. and, and just put it on top of it and then eat it. Sounds good. Yeah. All right, I'll have to try that. Well, it thank you so much. It's so great to see you again, Tim. Yes, yeah, good to see you. All right. Well, thank you so much for watching, everyone. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please leave me a comment below if you have questions for Tim. Uh, I'll pass them along. And I hope you enjoyed this. God bless you, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye. <laughs>